Today we're going to be talking about where do you begin when you want to automate? Yeah, and, where to start, right? Like what? Yeah. It's just like you, you hear these concepts. Maybe you go to like some trade, like, like Cisco Live. You go to these trade shows and then uh or conferences and then you hear like topics like well there's terraform and there's ansible and there's all these different you know if and you, you'll see a lot of the presenters sharing all these really innovative ways of how they've approached automation and some of the challenges behind it but then you might be stuck with like well you might be in a position of thinking like gee where do i even start uh i mean there's just so much to it like learning a new language do i do it this way do i just write it in code there is a lot. There is a lot. And, and, and for me, for getting started, there are a few pillars that I kind of look for as far as getting started. One of those being is that if you know how to do something, be it if you're a network engineer and you know how to configure a switch, that's important. Uh, knowing how to configure a router. If you're a server engineer, it's like, oh, okay, I know how to harden an OS, for example, make it like super secure. Uh, okay, you know how to do that. So the how is just as important as knowing, uh, or the what, I should say, what it is you're automating. And knowing that part is just as important as knowing how to do the automation. So you already have a huge advantage, which is that you you know what it is that needs to be automated. And that's that's super important. Then you, you then you start getting into the world of, of, of how to go about something like that. And so like where to get started, my thing is starts with something really small look for things that potentially at the very beginning aren't super impactful. So especially if you're, you're thinking about maybe your, your lab environment or maybe even production, I, I wouldn't, production is a lousy place to try and <laughs> try things, right? That's when you're, that's, that's your performance. That's when you're actually doing something. That's not a good place to practice, if you will. But if you're practicing and you want to get to know something, well, why not start small? Start with something that doesn't impact production. And that could be something like if, okay, if you're a network engineer, try setting the message of the day on a switch, right? If you are, um, if yeah, there's a message of the day, say in Linux, so you can, you can, it's something very similar the banner, right? So you could change the banner text. So when somebody reaches and logs in, you know, via the terminal, you just present them with a banner and says, Hey, you're not really supposed to be here unless you were actually authorized, so on and so forth. You, you, you could just set those things. You could set, for example, adding a DNS to a, a host, be that a switch, be that uh, a, um, some sort of virtual machine. It could be that you're you're already pretty adept with uh, Kubernetes and you know how to make uh, imperative commands. So why not uh, set them, you know, to be declarative instead and see if you can automate that process to the to the extent that you can. So again, knowing what it is that you're going to automate is just as important uh, as as how you go about it. So that would be my first one is just just getting that mindset of saying, okay, I think I'm going to do this programmatically. And so from there, there you have like two choices. You, you can go down the programming route uh, with a with a language uh, like Python. You could also do the configuration management route. And, and that's when you start opening up the world of Ansible and Terraform and so forth. And with a few lines of code, you can get automation to happen that would have otherwise taken you several lines of code, say in Python. Now granted, if you were doing that, this in Python, you're gonna get exactly what you want. It's gonna be very performant, but there's, there's some trade-offs, right? Maybe you don't wanna do it that way. Maybe you wanna do it through configuration management. I'm not gonna uh, weigh in on which one is better. They both have their, their advantages, so it's just up to you. But as a practitioner, when you're first getting started, dipping your toe into the water, uh, I mean, the way I did it is I used a configuration management tool and I just got it to do something very, very basic. And that, that, that's how I got started. Yeah, I mean, like you said, keep it simple. Um, and maybe at the end, maybe at the end you wanna be doing like the whole coding and everything, but sometimes you don't wanna make things so difficult that you wanna give up or make it so difficult that it's frustrating. So when you keep it simple, if it's just a couple clicks or a couple lines of code versus many lines of code, you know, go the simple simpler route. But also I think one I want to point out the fact that, you know, most things can be automated nowadays, but not everything can be automated. So you have to also take a look at the product that you are working with to make sure it can be automated and how can it be automated? Because not everything has a configuration manager to help with that right so um you know these are more general tips but basically take a look at the documentation for the product and make sure that you can automate these 
your product before you try to like bang your head over it and be like, wait, Mel said I could use a configuration manager. How come I can't find one? Um, and so I think that I just wanted to point that out. Yeah, good point. Like if it's it, if the if if the modules don't exist um, in, in the Ansible parlance, if you will, or the providers don't exist, well, you could write your own, and then you're right back to where it's like, okay, well, gee, I should have done this in Python or something, right? See, so but but I mean, you could write your own. That's that's one approach. But but like you said, if if it's not there, it's not even uh, possible potentially. Then yeah, if, if it's not if you know for example if it's not programmable at all like you're, you're dealing with some device that's not programmable at all that has no apis it has no way of getting to it um it doesn't support anything secure like ssh then yeah it's it's, it's going to be super problematic if not impossible to do but but yeah yeah as a developer i think that my my tip would be um if you are using apis to pro program uh, to automate um use a REST API tool to manually try all the APIs first and get that flow in and make sure everything is working first. Make sure you have like your parameters right, make sure you have your scheme right, all of that and be able to visually see it all and then you go move on to the programming piece of it because you know doing developer support i've gone helped a lot of people who would tell me hey this api is not working and when i had asked them have you even tried it on your system they'll be like no and it turns out that they don't actually have like the right url or they don't have the right parameters or they don't have the right things to pass in to make it successful in the first place. But now you're dealing with code in addition to getting errors and it just makes it a little bit harder. So um, even though we're automating a manual thing, uh, sometimes doing things manually first before you programmatically do it or automate it actually makes it your life a lot easier. So actually, you know, it reminds me like of what we were talking about earlier. It's like, is that a developer's way of perhaps breaking it down into smaller pieces? Like you're saying, you just just the small piece being like, let me call that API. Uh, maybe I'll use a tool like Postman or or just a curl command or what have you to make sure that I've got the UR the URLs correct, the URI is well formed. It's what what's being you know, and I'm passing the correct parameters. Am I getting the correct response? Is that is that am I getting that right? Yeah, I mean, at least me as a developer, that's the first thing that I always do. If I want to go use a REST API and I want to use it in some Python script or, um, you know, sometimes you do have tools to be able to call an API. And so I just want to make sure things work first. And I think it semi goes back to you, like what you had said, you need to know your domain. You need to know that first. So you need to make sure that something's working before you can automate it. Um, I mean, I'm pretty sure you've got, gotten, bought some product and went home and did all of this stuff, set it all up, and then turns out that the device was broken in the first place. You have to undo everything, and then you have to put it back in the box and take it back to the store <laughs> and get a new one. When in reality, if you had just tested it out first to make sure it's working before you did all of the stuff, then it would have saved you a lot of headache. And... Um, since we're talking about where to begin, the assumption is that you, our audience doesn't really have as much thorough, um, just experience with it. And you always, whenever you don't, whenever you're starting with anything, um, you always want to start small, right? You don't want to go and go to the extreme and say, I am going to build the whole application, right? So, um, my, my process whenever I'm trying to automate something is making sure that the REST APIs are working correctly, making sure I know what to pass in because, you know, as much as I hate to say, sometimes the documentation is incorrect. And so you might be following documentation, but if it's incorrect, you're not going to get it right in the first place. Well, good. I'm hoping this is a has provided some insight as to how you could probably you could get started with uh, automating things uh, be that something that you're automating for the network perhaps maybe you're a server engineer it, i mean it the it, it spans the gamut at the end of the day I, it, to review uh denise keep me honest here but what we're looking at is know your domain 
that's one of the first things to do. Second is you're going to choose some sort of language, be it program, uh, a programmable language like uh, Python, like just a computer language in general, or you could do something like a configuration management tool to help you get started to make the, which will bring you to the next step is make low uh, impactful change changes to something uh, at the very beginning. After that, you'll, 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 you'll kind of get your, your footing under you and you'll start to get into more advanced use cases and I think that's that's a pretty decent uh, groundwork to get, you know, or at least a, a decent roadmap, if you will, on your journey to getting started with automation. Denise, anything I've left out? Nope, I think that is absolutely correct. Just don't be fearful. Just start with something small, something that won't break. I think that's one of a lot of people's fears. It won't kill the system. Um, just try it out. And I think that, I don't know, just, just, You'll get hooked because you're like, wait, now I don't have to do this. I can go and automate many other things. Just start small and get your, you know, get a good foundation and then you can grow, get bigger in terms of what you can do to automate. Great. Well, thanks again for joining us. Leave us some comments down below if you feel like this is something that could help you out. Or if you have another way of approaching automation or, or that you did in your career, we'd love to share that with the community. As always, thanks for watching. Any closing remarks there, uh, Denise? No more closing remarks, but thank you for watching <laughs> and leave us a comment.